this computer. All right, good day, everyone. My two guests, two special guests today. Uh, let me put it this way. Every time I'm on a festival, whether it's teaching or I'm promoting, organizing, if one of these individuals are there, I'm not gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> there was a time where I usually, out, I have no idea. So if one of these two individuals are there, I feel safe. Uh, <laughs> let's welcome Dr. Ron Swarson from Colorado and Dr. Mirna Nahas in Calgary. How are you guys? Good. Doing Thank fine. You. Thank you. And how are we dealing with COVID in a personal life, in a personal way with you guys? I know Mirna is still active uh, in the uh, field of medicine and Ron, you're retired, yes? I'm retired. I'm dealing with it fine. Um, COVID negative a couple of times. So uh, I'm good to go at the moment. Myrna? Well, it's been a challenge those past few months, uh, especially living it and working it every day. So lots to adjust, uh, lots to live with. Uh, COVID negative as well. <laughs> so thank you. It's like... There is that question where, how do you know you have it? Some, there's, a, there's that notion publicly that when you have it, you don't even know you have it. Even if you, if you don't have the symptoms, it might go away, but you had it. You had it. Is this a true thing or it's just a myth? Ron? Well, Myrna, I think you're in the front line, so you can probably, <laughs> you, can start, you can start that one out. I, you I would have, like uh, to start that? Sure. Yeah, I, I have anecdotal evidence from some people around the world who have had it. Uh, that, you didn't know about well, it. We talk about, yeah, we talk about asymptomatic carriers. We talk about people who are brewing it because there's a, a, you know, a period where you, the virus is in your system before you actually develop the symptoms. So you might have it. That's why the isolation for 10 to 14 days, if you travel, if you're coming from outside a different <clears throat> province, a different state, a different country. So, so there are all of those factors. So you could have it, but not know, not know that you have it, or you could have it, have mild symptoms, not recognize those symptoms, but you still have it. Uh, the only way to know if you have it or not is of course to do the COVID testing, which is in here, we have two different types, nasopharyngeal swab or a throat swab. And then the rate of return of that test result varies depending on how many people are being tested, how busy the lab is, how busy, you know, your results are to get to you via phone or a message or something like that, so. <clears throat> there's also, I, I think also, um, there's some people who uh, are asymptomatic through the entire infection. It's such a mild infection uh, that they will go through it completely. And uh, actually, if you do the test at a later point in time, isn't it right, Myrna, that in the test, the COVID-19 standard PCR test would be negative, but their antibody test, we hopefully would turn positive and be able to tell that person in retrospect that they had the disease and they have some antibody protection, but that's, that's sort of in a questionable zone right now because the, the accuracy of that test is not uh, quite at the level that we would like it to be. The accuracy of the test that you have it at the time, that accuracy has increased dramatically since the beginning of development of the test. You know, um, we're, we're talking about symptoms here and because of that, because, you know, it's very, the symptoms are very similar to having influenza. And, and so whenever you have sniffles, you're coughing or your body aches and everything, you have that paranoia. It's like, oh shit, I have COVID-19. <laughs> I got to get tested or something. What are the symptoms? Can you name specifically the symptoms that are obvious to COVID-19? Uh, well, like I said, like, and like Ron said as well, the guidelines and everything is changing as, as we progress with this uh, disease and illness. Uh, we initially were screening people who were just coming from um, Wuhan, but now the uh, screening has expanded to everybody. We have uh, asymptomatic testing in Alberta right now. So, but we specifically look like when you're coming in to see us, we ask, do you have a fever? Do you have a cough? Do you have a sore throat? Um, or, 
not just a cough, worsening cough than before because people could have a chronic cough. So there's all these things, right? Uh, sniffly nose, but is this something new? Could people have allergies? Could it be just your allergies acting up or could it be COVID? So um, shortness of breath, mm. difficulty breathing. Um, so um, these are the main symptoms that we look for. And then uh, those are the, uh, 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 that gives you a reasonable reason to get tested, correct? Yes, yes. So anybody that comes in that tells me they're experiencing these symptoms, yeah. I would test them. Because yeah. here yeah. in uh, Nevada, Reno, where I live, they're not going to test you if there's no symptoms. <laughs> You're not going to get tested at all. They're going to reject you. <laughs> I mean, Ron? Well, that, that sounds like Nicaragua to me. <laughs> Um, that's exactly what happens there. I have, I have a friend there that got sick and she was pretty sure she had it, but she couldn't get tested. And uh, we were uh, chatting on WhatsApp and she said, I can't smell anything. My taste is all gone. And I went, well, uh, that's one of the you know symptoms you look for. And I said, uh, anything else? Well, I'm, I'm coughing. I'm very tired if I walk a block and my, I got a stomach ache. And huh. I just said, well, unless proven otherwise, you have COVID and I've kind of followed her through her course only by symptoms alone for almost three weeks now. Um, she's That's finally right, getting Ron. better. Thank you for bringing that up. Now we even headache, even nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, right? Generalized malaise, body aches, any of those could fit under the symptomatic category. But of course, like I said here, we are also testing asymptomatic people. We have a sign say, you know, if you're here, you'd like to be tested, you don't have any symptoms, let us know and we'll test you, so. The question is, um, in the medical field, in the, well, let me just ask this. Do we really know what COVID-19 is? I mean, there's a difference with coronavirus and then we get it specific to COVID-19, uh, that's the number. But do we really know? Because common sense for me is that if we don't know COVID-19, we can't treat it. There's no way to treat it. So I'm hearing all this confusing <laughs> information from Dr. Fauci to does Dr. Virtue, just everyone else getting different types of information every day. I gave up, I gave up listening. Uh, so the question is, do we really know what COVID-19 is? Ah, oh, good question. <laughs> and like, I am no expert at that. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, that's the disclaimer first, but we are, we are seeing it. We are dealing with it. Right. So the, the novel, the SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus, the coronavirus that causes the disease, which is COVID-19 for coronavirus disease 2019. So that's what we're dealing, we're talking about the disease itself. And that is the one that, do we have it or do we not have it? And that's when we test. And the, the swabs that we do carry here, they're quite accurate in telling us you have it or you, you don't have it. Right. And that's when we, we kind of treat or manage the symptoms based on that. Sure. Now, now, what are we talking about specifically here? Because there's so many different, like there's no real treatment per se. Um, that's what, you know, there's guidelines, there's studies, there's proposed treatments that could help. To minimize the symptoms, possibly, possibly not. So there's a lot of that going out there. So, what are we specifically talking about, Rodney? <laughs> <laughs> I, th I, th I think I think if you ask you, do we know what it is? And, and it, it, you can answer that in several different ways. The way her, you know, based it is one way. Another way is we certainly do know what the virus is. We know the genetic sequence. We know the nitty gritty, the science piece of it is identified and was shared worldwide fairly early in the, in the outbreak. Okay. So do we know what it is? We indeed do know what it is, and we do indeed know that it's different than other coronaviruses that have right. been identified historically. Right. So the answer is yes, we know what it is. Okay, so therefore, when we know something like that, we could actually develop a vaccine that's going to help, if that makes sense, because, you know. And we're both smiling. Uh, 
I was, wor I, was worried. I was worried there for a minute because if we really don't know what vaccine, we can't pinpoint it is, how the hell are you going to develop a vaccine <laughs> unless it's just symbolic? You know? um, um, yeah. Ron, were you, you're I, done. I'll start out on that one. <laughs> <laughs> how, you didn't, how you didn't we, think how, I was going to ask you that question. How, how, <laughs> how, so the question is, how are we going to develop a vaccine unless we know what it is? So we know what yeah. it is. Therefore, we should be able to develop a vaccine. Good, good. Well, and that's where we are at the moment. There's uh, well over 100 uh, researchers and companies and various entities that are working on a vaccine. And from various angles, from a traditional method of uh, creating vaccines, which have been successful in the past, and people will argue about whether some vaccines are successful or not, but let's say in comparison to the influenza vaccine and the big argument is it mutates it changes every year but changes guess what if you put the pros and the cons down the wins and the loses over the over the decades um we've we've won in the influenza uh, arena by being able to decrease its uh, its uh, uh incidence by selecting the proper <clears throat> virus, um, viruses to go after we've lost some too they haven't been as good some years yeah so uh, it, it, people will use that argument and say, well, you know, uh, coronavirus is mutating. We know it is. We already know that. Yeah. So, but we've dealt with that in the past as well. So with the traditional kinds of vaccines that are being developed, um, they have pretty much uh, a set timeline as to how long it's going to take to develop it. Although, um, and I'll say that from the medical and the science side of it, um, there are some what have been labeled novel vaccine uh, attempts that are going on at present that have uh, gained a lot of notoriety in the, in the media. Uh, and I, um, I've, I've read a lot about them. And it's kind of interesting. We don't know who's going to win the race, so to speak. And it has <laughs> a number of players that will um, affect which ones are going to come out first. I'm not going to say yeah. whether they're going to be the best ones or, you know, yet or not. Yeah. Um, one, an article I just read uh, late yesterday was about uh, <clears throat> getting a vaccine out in a, in a way that people can understand it, uh, that you don't do it unethically. And Got this it. is also in the news at present is, um, quote unquote, speeding to a vaccine. Is there such a thing that can be done? Uh, it has um, ethical components to it, which are in discussion at present. When you uh, say ethical components, is that political or is it just pretty much? No, it, it's, it's oh. purely ethical. All right. The, the point <laughs> is, is that it, some of these that are coming out, you, you notice that they've been asking for volunteers, human right. volunteers to right. experiment on. Now, in the standard way that you develop a vaccine, that's the last thing that you're doing and not, not doing early on. I see. in developing a vaccine because in essence, you don't really know what the long-term side effects are when you want to try to uh, you know, negate those as much as possible. Right. So the ethical standpoint is like practicing on humans. And I, Not I, rats, but humans. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. it's, it starts yeah. out and it goes through the primates, it goes through the whole testing process. Uh, interestingly enough, um, I, I just finished an article that says for 100 vaccines that come out, that are produced to go into the first stages of trial um, with the failures that occur at each stage and including the uh, FDA in the US turning them down, yeah. 10, 10 may make it through. So it's like a 90% wow. dropout. So we hear like, oh, there's 120 people working on vaccines. Great, we're gonna get one tomorrow. Well, if 90% of them drop out uh, and that's over time. That, that doesn't happen, you know, quickly. Um, you have to have that many people working on it in order to come up with, you know, uh, options that are viable. Um, so, so realistically, uh, Dr. Swarson, we're not going to be able to have a vaccine this year. If you look at the typical way vaccines are created, including these new techniques, and my opinion, strictly my opinion, not an expert, my disclaimer, probably not. At least for you and I, yeah, 
Now, some of these may make it to phase two to three, and some of them are actually moving in that direction into a phase three trial, which then includes a lot of people. Yeah. And then who are those people going to be? I have my opinion as to who they're going to be. <laughs> uh, and, and because one of the one of the entities in the U.S. that's interested in getting this vaccine is the Department of Defense. Got it. Uh, for obvious reasons. For obvious reasons, yes. They also have a captured population. Okay. They say, line up, you're getting vaccinations today. And everybody runs through. Now, I'm not, I mean, that's a speculation. But I've been in a study when I was in medical school. I didn't quite know what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, naive as I was at, the, at that time. Uh, so I anticipate that we're going to see some of this machinery start to roll in the next couple of months. I don't know how much of it we'll get to know media-wise and how much we're going to be told exactly by it. But when I start to read who the players are and who's really interested in getting it, Oh, go ahead. And I go like, okay, well, that makes me scratch my head. And I go, it's great to have a captured population to do a test on. See, that's uh, the so thing. We don't know. We don't many, know. That's the thing that many don't realize that the players in the business, <laughs> we're, we're, we're not taking that into account. <laughs> that... It, it, it is an element. It is an element that has to be taken into account. And that's why you see the bigger players with the deeper pockets capable of moving ahead at a more rapid rate. Uh, and then we shift out of medicine, then we get into the business side of it. But these players have been around quite a long time and have de developed a whole lot of good treatments over 40, 50 sure. years or more. Sure. So it's to be expected. Um, yeah. Doctor, and nice. usually, Ron. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Oh, I was just going to add to that, that, that phase three, which is some of those companies are at right now, usually that could take years, you know, in order to, to right. see if there is an effect, yes. if there is any long-term side effect. Uh, and we're trying to crunch it all into weeks and months. So, I mean, if we think back, how long did it take for us to, to get a vaccine on the AIDS virus? That was a long time, wasn't it? I think it, I think it goes at about 10 years. Yeah. I think that's a number that I've, I've read. <clears throat> it could be a little longer, could be a little less, but that one pops out in my head in an article I just read. Um, that's pretty standard slow procedure, so to speak. Yeah. Um, there's some vaccines that were developed along the way that were sort of stopped. Yeah. Because, because the epidemic stopped. They were able to control it by other means. And then you go like, well, we're not going to put all that money in R&D, you know, the millions and billions, but of course, that's another whole side uh, you know, discussion, um, you know, where the money comes from and so on and so forth. But um, it just doesn't make business sense to do it. And that's the way the real world works, and, you know, fortunate or unfortunate. Well, meanwhile, speaking of other means in treating this virus, Dr. Nahas, is strong immune system a better way to prevent uh, COVID-19? Ah, uh, another slippery <laughs> question. I know, I know real Andy. doctors. I know real <laughs> doctors who usually say that. <laughs> wow, that is a good question there. Well, and there's so many variables there too, yeah. right? The person itself, the individual, each person, you know, has their own different, you know, immune system and immune response. Uh, age is a factor. Uh, we're talking about some now. Uh, um, uh, articles are coming out about ethnicity is a variable in that. So, yes. Yes, exactly. But of course, we all know, you know, leading a healthy lifestyle, uh, you know, getting enough sleep, um, you know, um, exercising, uh, reducing stress, uh, doing everything that you could do to kind of limit the infection or getting, you know, the risk of getting infect, infected, such as washing your hands, you know, cooking your meals properly, all that stuff. So these are all factors mm. that could help boost your immune system. But is that, um, you know, a factor that could help with COVID-19? It's, 
I, I can't, I can't speak to I, that, I, but we I, do I know think, that. I think it's more of like a prevention of what I was talking about. It's, I know it's totally different when you have COVID-19 yeah. and raising the yeah. immune system at the same time. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. But yeah, so, you know, we all know, uh, yeah, if, if you live healthy and, and do the stuff that we talked about, then of course that could give you a protective factor. Right, right. But, right. but there's a lot of other uh, elements at play here too that are unknown that you know that could contribute to that too. Dr. Swarson? Yeah I, I agree I think that you know one of the other elements uh, that um, I think we have to kind of add in there is your own genetics you know that also goes into the ethnicity the racial yeah. situation and stuff is genetics controls so much as to you know what's going to happen to you down the road. Yeah. You know, in other words, the best thing you could do, uh, you know, in, in regard to your own health and, and uh, longevity is pick your parents. <laughs> you, you want a couple a of good tough. ones, so then, you know, and then go, go look at your grandparents and a couple of skip generations and see. Um, yeah. That's your best bet. Okay, now we get down to social distancing. Uh, wearing mask and everything, because as you know, uh, our in our dance industry, and when I say our dance industry, because you guys are very much involved in the dance business nowadays, which I will ask you later, how the hell you got into it. But <laughs> um, what's the future of our dance industry then, given that this vaccine is going to be slow, and that social distancing will be applied? and thereby wearing mask and everything. Well, first of all, let me ask you this question. Does wearing mask really does prevent COVID-19? It's another controversial question, isn't it? <laughs> all right, I'll, I'll give it's you the good. answer. <laughs> and then we can expand on it. Yeah. It's the way you're asking the question, Rodney, does it prevent or does it protect? <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yes. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. okay, counselor, would you reword that question before I answer? Yes, please. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry for taking you into that question. So, so let, me, let me change the question. <laughs> Does wearing masks help in prevention of, you know, the COVID-19 phenomenon? Um, short answer, yes. Long answer, Myrna. <laughs> I, I have a long answer too, but you know. I, wait, wait, wait. Before uh, Myrna answered this, what type of mask? Got him uh, right, in, <laughs> right, right in there, you know. Yeah. I know. Hey, there you well, go. Of course. <laughs> well, the type of mask, the best one is the one that's recommended by NIOSH, uh, the N95, which is the one that filters 95 plus percent of that's the pretty much the medical mask right the medical mask that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah show and tell but but uh because these are you know we're asking that they remain for because we, we were having a shortage at one point and people were scrambling especially in the medical profession people frontline workers dealing with patients so so we're we're recommending surgical masks and, and, you know, when these, you know, were, oh my God, the supply is running low. So now they're recommending the homemade or yeah, cloth yeah. mask. Yeah. Cloth mask. So something is better than nothing. Got it. For, for preventing, for if you want to, you know, be part of the solution kind of thing. So, so yes. So these are the stepwise mask kind of recommendation. What are your thoughts, Ron? I, I'm, I'm the same way. I mean, something is better than nothing. And um, the quality of mask that you can use can be helpful. Ag again, you can go up to the, you know, more med medical grade in 95s. They're also more expensive. Yeah. You know, you have to keep that in mind. It, if they're used properly and thrown away after each time, if you go try to buy those on Amazon, you're going to pay two to four dollars a mask. Yeah, that's that's a lot, and it keeps you from going to the grocery store too often. Yeah, um, but those things need to be taken into account. And you can, interestingly, 
enough um, the medical grade surgical masks versus the non-medical, or I should say certified, non-certified, they literally look identical, feel identical, but they have a different certification. Wow. Majority of them come out of China too. Well. <laughs> now I'm, I'm, I'm not casting dispersions or anything. Well, I'm just saying I've got, you know, boxes, uh, was, was able to get some boxes of surgical grade certified uh, through our medical society here. And the boxes came through as not stamped as certified. And they go, these are supposed to be. So they replaced them, got them. And we happen to have a testing facility at a college just up the road here that does specifically this kind of work, uh, air quality. Yeah. And they were sent there and, and the entire batch was randomly tested to see if they were meeting the criteria. And they, and they did. But the first batch did not. Uh, it, oh. you can't, you can't see that. Yeah. You can't see that. No, you but can't. But again, yeah. But the fallback is, you know, what Myrna said is something is better than nothing. I mean, there's, that's been proven. That's been proven. And you're going to see all sorts of things out there from other doctors, from media and everything else. It's saying like, um, no big deal. And I'm going like, the other side of the coin is, is if you can help reduce the quantity of transmission of the disease, then you're pushing it toward the zero point and uh, ultimately giving time for the, um, the vaccines to be developed and pushing toward what they call the herd immunity that people talk about, um, which by the way is kind of labeled at about 70% of the world population. That's indeed another topic to discuss about. Yeah, but uh, maybe, I, maybe maybe the next one. <laughs> no, that's, that's going to be a, a lengthy discussion. <laughs> that's, a, that's a sidebar of vaccines and et, et cetera, and it's not not in the scope of the discussion. Yeah, it's um, it, it's another mistake that uh, our people are are doing is that whether they're wearing clothing, uh, uh, the clothes mask, they don't wash it. You're supposed to wash that every day. And the disposable one, you're supposed to dispose that at the end of the day. <laughs> and th I knew this because when yeah. I used to work for yeah. Amazon, every time I take a break, I take <laughs> off the mask, they give me a new mask. That's 15 minutes ago. <laughs> you know? Yes. Rodney, it's not just you, you have to wash the cloth mask. It's, <clears throat> the recommendation is you wash your hands before you put the mask on. And then you wash your hands before you take it off, yeah. whatever, whether you dispose of it in the garbage, if it's the disposable one, or you put it in the laundry to wash it, and then you wash your hands after you take it off. So that, and then how it fits, it has to fit on the nose, cover the mouth, and the yeah. that's the proper way to wear the mask. You know, you see people wearing the mask under the nose, yeah, we saw or something on that. the forehead, or under the chin. Yeah, yeah that's not the right way. Yeah. Here's another question for you guys. I, I came across an article, and that's the reason I invited uh, an eye doctor, but she could not make it because she's busy, uh, one of my friend, uh, Dr. Lana. We were talking about transmission. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there is a reason why you have masks, because you touch your face all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? I, I, I wish I could pinpoint and show you the article right now, but I can't. It gets transmitted to the eyes when you touch your eyes. That's another factor there. Uh, and also, she, she also told me that when it comes to testing, she could also determine if you have COVID through the eyes, dilation, examinations, whatever. But isn't that interesting that you touch your face, sometimes you touch your eye because it's itchy. I mean, yeah. what do you guys, did you come across a, an article like that or what? Well, we do actually, uh, sorry, that one of the criteria for screening is pink eye and ball, so that's another, <laughs> see, see now, it's <laughs> coming to that. But yes, that's why we say, wash your hands, don't touch your face. So any, it, it will go through any mucous membrane. So right. nose, mouth, right. eyes, yes. And that's where, for us in the medical field, not just the, the you know, surgical mask, or uh, but we also wear proper eye protection so something not this is not good enough for me at work it has to come all the way around shield, right? yeah. and then the shield yeah. yes so yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Ron? Yeah, it's the, it's the issue of any mucous membrane. Got and it. that's simply the eyes, the nose, the mouth for starters. Yeah. Wow. Now, what do you think is the impact of this uh, in our dance industry in the future? How it would affect it? Since we know that the vaccine is going to be slow. I mean, I used to joke around with my friends or my wife, like, just come up with a vaccine, even though it doesn't work, it's symbolic. <laughs> People are going to start dancing and out of fear again. You know what? I mean, what's the impact of this, guys? Especially, I know uh, Myrna is one of the co-organizers of uh, BKS Calgary. Uh, that's how I met her. And of course, Ron uh, is always at my festival where it's DJing or, or, or just hanging out. But... I like him to DJ because he's a good mambo DJ and bachata DJ, but he's always there or he's in the Dominican Republic all the time for crying <laughs> out loud. <laughs> Go ahead, Ron. <laughs> oh, the effect on the dance community, I think we've already seen that because there have been some uh, that have tried to, you know, go directly into, you know, we don't need that mask, we're going to go do it. And unfortunately, you know, they've ended up with a, a definite uh, pods yes. of COVID. Um, dance industry um, in the, uh, the fitness industry, which is somewhat parallel. Yeah. Uh, you know, what occurred with, uh, I think uh, in South Korea, there were like 27 instructors that went out to their clubs after a I big event that. and they got uh, 112 other cases out of 27 people. Um, so, you know, the effect, you know, it's huge. The effect on the dance industry uh, the uh, financial dynamics of the industry since uh, I know I've, you know, promoted some of the concert events and stuff and you're working on a shoestring. Um, some of the established ones that have been around that are huge in the world, believe it or not, although they, you know, deserve to make money for what they do as a business is um, I suspect that the margin isn't quite as good as we would like to think that it is. And you can comment on that and in regard to that. So I think, um, I mean, here in, in Denver, we've seen uh, them doing some outdoor classes, uh, completely masked up, social distancing, doing everything they can, no partner work. Uh, you know, it's all footwork and, and basics. And I haven't seen anything, any fallout from that. Uh, but it's also just following, you know, your four or five or six basic rules of how to pre uh, prevent transmission. Yeah. Um, I had a discussion um, a week ago with our, our flagship uh, Latin club about, you know, they want to get back to doing something. Um, they're, you know, reasonably well healed. They've been around for 22 years. But that being said is that they're not going to sustain anything, you know, ad infinitum forever. And they're talking about doing an outdoor event and enforcing the masks, enforcing uh, social distancing, and uh, no, you can come with a partner that you live with, but outside of that, what are you going to do? I mean, you can't, I said, how are you, how's your security going to handle that? If you take a huge parking lot and you have people dancing, there's going to be outliers, I guarantee you. And there's going to be looky loos on the street if you don't put up a chain link fence that are also going to be outliers. And it's, it's wrought with a lot of difficulties on how to manage it. Certainly, you don't want to go indoors. That's about the worst thing that you can do at the moment. At the moment, yeah. Maybe, you know, small outdoor events with uh, 10 to 20 people or, you know, um, 10 couples, uh, something of that nature. Um, I, had, I had this uh, tongue-in-cheek thought. Um, but putting speakers in the back of my SUV and I'll do it in your driveway for you and your special <laughs> one, you know, uh, by the way, it works. <laughs> it works really well. That's a good marketing um, right there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it's a, a little slim to be, uh, you know, driving 20 miles to uh, play for 45 minutes, but you know, nonetheless, uh, it's a passion for me. So I was just trying to see if I could actually get it done. And we, we actually did it for a, um, a birthday. A yeah. drive-by birthday. A drive-by birthday. A drive-by birthday. <laughs> I think it was just, it was great. It was fun. I but, would like to uh, be able to organize a congress mm -hmm. and say, 
it's sold out, folks. We have 10 people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't you? Yeah. The, uh, it's, it's deep and wide now. I mean, and um, certainly I think it's um, stimulated creativity amongst the instructors and groups to uh, do a variety of virtual uh, yeah. classes. Yeah. Um, they got to get the classes can work. I'm so not feeling that, to be honest with you. I'm well, so not into it. it I'm, I, I've done a, I've done a couple, and you know, I was very picky on who it was. They were it was done in the Dominican Republic, so I, I kind of know some of the people, and they're right. very high, right. high quality. Um, and you can, you know, view the videos of the stuff afterwards. Of course, yeah. The the Zoom parties, not so good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get it, but. <laughs> I, had, I, mean, I, I went to a Zoom, I DJed a Zoom party. Did you? <laughs> I did. <laughs> and I'm like, um, well, this really doesn't feel very good on this side as a DJ because I don't know who's on the dance floor and who is it. <laughs> That's what I yeah. was talking about. I, I don't know. That guy over there, I know his favorite song, so <laughs> I'll play his because he's going to bring out two or three people or four. So <laughs> as, as a DJ, it's pretty sterile. <laughs> Before Myrna uh, commented on this, we were just talking about outdoor, right? Uh, three days yes. ago, I saw an article in the news in Oakland, California, particularly the Lake Merritt area, where they do a lot of outdoors activities. That's include dancing. Well, guess what? COVID-19 is so right there that a lot of people got infected. Wow. There goes about, there goes wow. the outdoor activities. Now, the question is, it didn't, I'm not sure if I read it in the article whether it specified whether they were wearing masks or not. So I, I have to get back to the article, but that cancels that notion that, yeah, it's better in outdoor because, you know, the virus would just, you know, if you have the, no, I, I, I don't think it works. I, I really, I mean, given that, it becomes political also because you, you see this rallies, you, these protests and all of that stuff, and there's no report that there's one infected. There's so, it, it became so political so I'm so disgusted with it. But go ahead, Myrna, let's comment on the, the outdoor activities and the future of dancing, the impact. Uh, yeah, well, as you guys, well, even with the outdoor activities and that's for now with the phase that we're at right now, you still have to maintain the the physical distance as well. Yeah. So it has to be yeah. six feet, two meters apart. If you cannot do that, you have to wear the mask, wash your hands, all that kind of stuff. So, and, and you know, we are, you know, humans, we're social by nature. And this is just so different than what we're used to. And dancing is not the same, you know, if you're not dancing with a partner. So that's, I think until we find a vaccine that's gonna work, that's efficacious, yeah. um, things might be different for a while. And I, I did watch your vlog with, with Nate and um, Grant about, you know, the future of the Congresses and stuff, yeah. you know, it looks like it might be a while down the road coming to where we can actually be in one, you know, contained space. And, and you know the budget, Marina, you know the budget when it comes to small congresses and big congresses. It's a big, big loss of money, as you know. I know. And I so know. it makes us promoters uh, scared shitless <laughs> when it comes to organizing again. I think we would hesitate so bad. Uh, although maybe in the near future, a year from now, two years from now, the only thing I can think of is probably Hawaii because uh, Ron knows this, it's in a small capacity. We could do outdoors or whatever, uh, given that there will at least be vaccine approved or whatever. But getting back into the vaccine, meanwhile though, however, you guys, with therapeutic treatment, help whether it's hydrochloroxine or zinc uh uh with a with a better delivery system getting into uh your bloodstream or whatnot uh i mean what are the possible therapeutic 
treatment and what's the difference within the therapeutic treatment like when you have influenza if there's no vaccine they just send you home drink a lot of liquids uh take pain medication what have you okay is that similar to what we're doing here in COVID 19 when it comes to therapeutic treatment rodney this is like such a a, a virus that we haven't seen before right. we're still seeing some of some of its effects some of the side effects you know some of the long-term consequences from people have been you know infected with it oh, wait, let, me uh, interrupt and, let me interrupt you there we know from some of our dancers in the industry that has COVID, survived it. From what I heard, and I'm going to interview Andrea uh, uh, Thursday and really ask her this, they're not 100%. Exactly. Go ahead, Myrna. Yeah, so that's exactly what I mean, is that what are we targeting here? I've, I've read all the studies about you know hydroxychloroquine, about prednisone, about azithromycin or azithromax about you know the, some anti antiviral medications the zinc as well i don't think they're all you know studies but there's no proven 100 percent uh efficacy uh, it's, all, it's all anecdotal yeah yeah exactly and <clears throat> and just like in vaccines to to get the to, to get the hundred percent knowledge about that medication and if it's effective, we need to test it. We need to do studies about it. And testing it in humans is unethical for 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 so many yeah. different reasons. Several reasons, right? yeah. Yeah. Ron, I I, I, oh, I, know, yeah. I there's, there's hey Ron, different. at our age, I know we need some therapeutic <laughs> vitamins and all of that stuff. I mean, <laughs> I I take vitamin C. <laughs> no, um, well, there, you know, there's two class, classifications. There's, you know, medication that you talked about, about being maybe prophylactic. Yeah. You're going to take it and you're going to prevent it. Uh, there's nothing out there that I see that's saying that that's an absolute for a number of these um, recognized treatments that are being used. Right. So... Uh, the next step is not not dissimilar to um, the influenza. We have uh, Tamiflu, is that right, Myrna? Yeah, Tamiflu. Tamiflu yeah. a lot. And if yeah. you catch it at the right time and you hit it at the right moment, uh, you can reduce the um, the intensity of it. Um, mm -hmm. That, at least from what I read, and maybe Myrna, you can let me know more about that, is that we we really can't say we've hit the sweet spot of like knowing exactly no. where in the role of events you have to hit. Otherwise you're going to, you're going to strike out or you're, you're going to miss it. You're going to have a, a less than a, a optimal effect. So there, you know, the two elements in, in this pandemic is yeah, currently treatment, you know, being able to get people through it. And another, the next one is vaccine. Um, so it, I think, I think it's sort of a combination of both. I think the treatment things are being worked on as we speak. The amount of knowledge that has been gained since uh, Jan December, January is remarkable. Um, and we are being able to identify things that actually can work. Um, they're not, you know, I don't say go out and get COVID tomorrow because we're going to be able to cure you because that's not the, not the case. Yeah. Um, it's not like taking penicillin for a strep throat. We know that works. Yeah. Um, but the vaccine is really tantamount to, to gaining control over the, over the pandemic in the long run and, the long future, run, yeah. and future appearances of yeah. uh, COVID-19, which in my opinion, we're going to be living with it for it's a very long away. time. Yeah. Yeah. It's not going to go not away. Going away. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, we'll get better at it. But I don't think it's going to be by the end of this year. No, um, I doubt it either. I mean, I, I just have my opinions based on being around medicine for, what, 45, 50 years. Yeah. And going like, um, you better strap in for the long run because it's going to take that time. And we're going to have to learn to bend with what's going on in order to get to a better place. This is the reason why, as a dance promoter, 
I set it aside already. I already, I'm, I'm going with plan B already, which is concentrate on non dance things, you know, whether I get a real job, uh, 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 get into another career. Uh, and even if this is, let's say COVID-19 is controlled or controllable, uh, it's just gonna be a, a, a second career for me as far as dancing is concerned. Uh, uh, it's not going to be as full time anymore. There are probably certain festivals I'd like to keep, as you all know. <laughs> yes. I definitely still want to go with Myrna's, uh, Bernard and Myrna's Congress because, by the way, Ron, you got to go to that Congress. It's one of the best uh, uh, festival I've been to when it comes to social dancing mm. and when it comes to music. You, you got three rooms there. You got Kizamba, you got Bachata, and then you got, uh, uh, of course, Mambo Salsa. Uh, I, I would encourage uh, Bernard to hire you as a mambo DJ because <laughs> he is, not too many people know this, but, but before I, before, but uh, before Bachata, I hired Ron as a mambo DJ. Not to, a lot of people know him as a Bachata DJ, but not too many people, this guy got really great mambo, mambo music. He knows his music. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's going Where to... Where do I send the Vimo, uh, Venmo to? On that? <laughs> <laughs> you, you can send it. Yeah, to, I, appreciate, uh, I appreciate that, Rod. Yeah, you, could send it, you could send it to Rod Chata Needs Money. At <laughs> <laughs> um, what's it like now in the medical field, in the hospital, in the clinics, Myrna, because you're active? What's it like when it comes to the number of patients coming in? Uh, initially, when, when we went into um, pretty much lockdown, uh, that was March 16 here in Calgary, where I work. Yeah. And uh, uh, so, and, and the, you know, the, the advice was, you know, stay at home. Right. And, and so our numbers dropped considerably. And that's, you know, in all my years of working, I have never seen anything like that. And then the restrictions started lifting off. And uh, now we're in phase two here in Calgary. And we're seeing our numbers going up. We're still maybe at about 20% less than what we normally see in a 24 hour period. But people are starting to come out and come and see us. And the scary thing with, with people not wanting to come to the hospital during the pandemic at the initial phases is that people were scared. They didn't right. want to go out. They didn't want to catch the virus. So they were sitting at home with other illnesses that, you know, could be prevented or could be dealt with um, and sitting at home, not coming and seeking medical attention. And now we're seeing them at the later stages that we're trying to do, you know, <laughs> trying to fix it, whereas we could have tried to prevent it earlier on. So, so let's such as heart attacks, strokes and stuff like that. Myrna in Calgary, when it comes to COVID-19, do, 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 do individuals get free testing? Because I know here in Reno, no. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, that's what I was talking in, at the beginning of the interview. We do have, like our screening criteria, like I said, has changed. So, you know, in the initial phases of the pandemic, somebody came in and told me, oh, I was in Toronto and I need to be tested. But that was at the beginning of the early stages. And I'm like, I'm sorry you know you don't qualify for that and then if you had waited two three days later we had extended our testing criteria to include other you know parts of the world so the criteria changed but now yes <clears throat> excuse me we do test symptomatic and asymptomatic people ron in colorado uh in colorado anybody can get tested anytime they want but they have, they, uh yes yes they have a huge drive-through thing set up by one of the stadiums that's been going on for quite some time. So they are increasing the amount of tests being done. I mean, as simple as um, I had a pretty bad cold a couple of weeks ago and I called my doc and I said, he said, now yeah, let's go ahead and go get you tested. And of course that's what I wanted to do, but I have to clear things with him. And it was a drive through uh, situation as well and all covered by, in my situation, it's covered by insurance. But it's also, um, that one was run by the National Jewish Hospital, which is a respiratory hospital um, of uh, some significance actually internationally. Um, the people who went through the public um, testings were saying they were 
taking six to seven to eight days to find yeah. out. No, that's not so good if you really think you got the disease. Right. Uh, in, yeah. in the more private setting with the national Jewish system, I got a call the next day with my results, 24 hours. Um, that whole issue of testing is, I, I think it's actually important and interesting now because uh, first testing and contact tracing, which is a whole another whole subject, but for us in the dance community, if anything's going to happen and you're going to need to know that you're negative for at least the next 12 hours or, or whatever, then um, some of the testings that are coming out are quite interesting. There's some actual um, articles I've read about, um, like a breathalyzer test that gets you the results in like 30 seconds. Right. That's been developed in, uh, in Israel and being tested. There's another breath test going on and someplace else in the world. I can't remember which it is. Australia. That, oh, that was Australia. Yes. Okay, yeah. right. Yeah. Okay, I'm, That's I'm glad Myrna can remember better than I can. <laughs> do you guys so, still, uh, do, you st do you, you know, I know doctors get peer reviewed journals every month or whatever. You still, you still, you still get those? Well, uh, Myrna? I, <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, my, my folder for COVID-19 information is overflowing because, uh, <laughs> yes, information overload from every, uh, you know, uh, medical journal. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I used to yeah, get a lot when I used, I used to be in bodybuilding and I used to get a lot of those, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, unlike you guys, you guys are very cautious, but when it comes to bodybuilder, we're lab rats. Uh, <laughs> and so we're into anecdotal evidences whether, uh, I mean, would you believe that back then Viagra was for blood pressure medication? <laughs> and then somebody discovers like, oh, something is wrong here. No, but anyway, but that's how we discovered uh, certain type of drugs. And then, you know, uh, FDA recognizes it, at least, you know, some of them. But uh, I mean, Ron, uh, yeah. Still, yeah. Do you still read I, the journals? I get, I get, uh, I get some of them in electronic form now. Love it, but yeah. I, not as many as I did when I was in active practice. But interesting enough, in the in the in the COVID nineteen situation, um, there's a number of resources out there, publishers and so on, that you can get into as access, a, yeah. a, access but you also pay sixty dollars a month, of course, in order to print out anything, or if you're just a one-time, you know, pacify person, you'll spend $32 for eight pages of an article. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, in the COVID-19 situation, a number of these publishers have, um, have taken away that, that barrier. And I can go in and find a ton of articles now and download them in PDF format and print them out and read them. And for me, it's great. I mean, I'd love to get in there and I'm, I sometimes will get, you know, see an article or something, go, oh, man, it's protected, it's $30, and so I'll figure out another way to get it, which usually I can. I love but, reading those articles, I really do. Yeah, and um, for the other aspects of medicine that are not COVID, you still have to have a membership, or in some instances, I don't know, maybe with Myrna, uh, their uh, hospital may have a, a hospital membership, and as a member of the staff, you have access, free access to all that. Yeah. <clears throat> and I used to have it through a hospital and I could get anything from anywhere and just actually send a message to um, the, the medical school library here in Denver and they'd like, email me the article. So, I mean, that's, that was nice at, at that point in time. And, um, but you had to be associated with someone. Right, to do that. right. But in COVID, anybody can go search around and look, the important thing is to recognize what's not garbage. Of course. Um, that, yes. you know, is either scholarly, peer reviewed, peer reviewed et cetera, yeah. and you start to recognize, yeah. you know, the name brands of, you know, Lancet, New England Journal of Medicine, Nature Science, and so on, although occasionally they make mistakes. <laughs> uh, New England Journal and Lancet had to retract an article, you know, for, for bad data that was put, that they all, both got. You know, they, they drank the Kool-Aid and got, they and to, got they hurt. They have a good reputation, by the way. <laughs> and yes, in general, they do. Yeah. Once yeah. in a while, you know, things happen by uh, data companies that don't have the same uh, ethical values. Right. Um, last question, uh, two of you. 
how did you get into dancing? Why did you get into dancing? And with your professional experience and background, why the hell are you still dancing? <laughs> Go ahead, uh, Myrna. <laughs> I think she froze. Okay. Uh -oh. Go ahead, uh, Ron. Well, okay, this was um, about a couple years post-divorce, one of my friends Said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm at home and at 9.30 every night I'm in bed. And she said, you ought to try salsa dancing. And I go, so for at least another year and a half, I thought about it and ultimately started taking lessons and one thing led to another. You know, I went through the zone of I either get serious and do a lot of classes and learn about this or stop now. And so that was the, the beginning of the, the dancing and exposure to you know salsa, cha cha, bachata, etc. And about three years later, I started getting interested in the history of the music, history of salsa. That explains and, the music, great music that you have. Yeah, and then um, from there it grew, and I said, oh, I can get this little program that'll actually play one song and then the next song and so on, and you can you know use them into, as you move along. And I go like, what the little DJ program? And the rest <laughs> is history. You know, from there, as it was about, about the third year out, after some friends of mine were going out and DJing at events. And I said, uh, okay, I'm setting a goal. By the end of year three, I wanna go someplace and DJ. And you were the one who hired me. That was that Mambo, you know, salsa room in, in Reno. In Reno, yeah. It, Oh, and, I'm uh, back. Hi. Hi, she's back. <laughs> I'm glad you're you're back. So. I don't know what happened. Like, listen, I wanted to hear Ron's story. I guess. Yeah, I well, uh, he's finishing after. up. Go ahead, Ron. Okay. So after after that event, I think I DJed for you the next year, and uh, it wasn't. It's was actually around that time that I got exposed to the real deal bachata with Juan Soriano in uh, Reno before Reno. you yeah. you went independent. Yeah. And that was an explosion. That I was mean, an incredible. You remember incredible. the workshop with Carlos and all of that stuff? That was great. We're, we're at the ground zone of everything that Carlos developed subsequent to that. That Indeed. was insane. Yeah. yeah. There were 100 people at their lunch hour watching this uh, class on musicality and bachata. And it was off the cuff. Not too and many it, people realize that that will never happen again. That was rare occasion. That's it. It's like Woodstock one. Yeah. You never get another one like it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, that was an amazing weekend in multiple, multiple ways. I met Johan briefly. The fact that I could hardly speak a Spanish, Spanish word. You, you became time. friends though. You became friends afterwards. I get a message from him every week. How you doing? I know what's going on. What's happening with him. Uh, it's been, um, Oh, quite an experience because when I ended up going to the Dominican Republic the first or second time and uh, I remember you know Ben told me you must call him I said I don't speak enough Spanish he says no you call him and uh, I did and he showed up and long story short I, I just have to say this he said I have danced on the farm in La Luisa with his father his mother and about another 20 other kids running around that I have no idea who they were related to. That was, really a, bless that was really a blessing for your Ron that you got to hang out with him while, I, while he was still alive. It was, that was an amazing day. It will never be equaled. Yeah. And I'm so grateful for having had that opportunity. Not to mention you hang out with his br uh, late brother also. Well, back in the day, I, you know, he was in the band the first two times that yeah. I had them come to Denver. Fernando. You know, yeah. I've had him three times here in Denver and the first two times uh, he was, he was with them. Um, that was a sad time. Why did you fall in love with DR? You know, it's not the DR, it's the music. Yeah. Okay. It's the music of bachata, you know, the traditional bachata for me came, <clears throat> it was a tranquilizer. <laughs> I can, <laughs> I can put them, you know, I, things are going whatever they are and go like, you know, my, my, my son who's going through his second degree and living with me at the time, when yeah. he takes off to go visit his friends, I run into this room where I'm now where my music all is and my speakers yes. and I jam it through the whole house and I put on a list of bachata and I'm going like, I'm fine. 
<laughs> All the stressors are gone. I go out walking. You know, it's bachata, merengue. I, you know, the salsa is in there too. I haven't, yeah, I haven't gone away from it. But when the bachata comes on, one of those older songs. And, it's just great. You know, Louis Varga comes on with something. Yeah. And I'm like, uh, yeah, I hope I don't walk out in the street, get hit by a car. <laughs> <laughs> Myrna, how did you get into dancing? Why you're still doing it? And my God, uh, I know you've been doing it for years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I started in second year med school, actually. I took ballroom classes. I started with really? that long, huh? the university, through oh, the university. Wow. Yeah. And uh, a friend of mine once uh, suggested, let's go practice our dance moves uh, at a club here. And it's Don Quixote's. It's no longer existent now, but uh, that's how I got introduced to the self and the bachata well bachata wasn't there popular at that time yet yeah. but uh, the salsa and the merengue then yeah and I found my my calling then so so I took more classes with that and uh, yeah I joined the dance team and I've been dancing with Salsa Rica for the last 10 years or so and uh, yeah and then met Bernard and you know joined forces with him on his event so okay. Okay. Been, it's been fun. It, this is my way of relieving stress. It's something to do that's not, you know, medically related, that kind of keeps me in shape, um, allows me to go out and socialize, not anymore, to socialize and, and, and see people, meet people. I love meeting people. I'm a people person. Yes, you are. Uh, and how it's been affecting us, this, it's, I cannot really, I cannot wait uh, to be able to go out and, and do it the way yeah. it used to be. I don't know how it's going to be in the future, but things have definitely changed now. Well, uh, doctors, I want to thank you for your time, uh, sharing your expertise. I know we didn't really talk about your background here, but I'm going to bring you back, talk more about your background in the medical field, which are very extensive. I know I've done my research for both of you. This is the reason you're in my podcast. But <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> scary. Great. And it's great to have friends like you. I feel safer. But <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, I will bring you back again to talk about, of course, more in COVID-19. We haven't really uh, touched everything uh, and other uh, issues. Um, and uh, I really want to thank you for your time. I will bring you back again. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's been a You're pleasure. welcome. Thank you very much for having us. And ladies and gentlemen, we, if you have any questions uh, with the two, two doctors, uh, there's a comment section on YouTube. Post your questions there. Uh, I will, I will uh, give it to them when there's a, a question asked and they'll be able to ask your questions. And if you ever have personal questions uh, and you want to get in touch with them, Ron, email address? Or Facebook maybe? Yeah, Facebook is uh, Ron Swarson, DJRJ. Myrna? Same thing here. Facebook, your Nana has. All right. All right, so great day. I will bring you back again. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Riding. Good afternoon. Bye, Bye Myrna. Bye.